Good evening, everyone, and welcome along to our Feroiga Career Coaching Clinic, focusing tonight on careers in trades and apprenticeships. This is an exciting initiative created by Feroiga to provide young people with an opportunity to learn about careers and professions that they may be considering. Feroiga is the leading youth organisation, engaging one in 10 young people in Ireland. Feroiga encourages young people to take responsibility for themselves and to be part of shaping the world around them. You can get involved through your local club or you can avail of one of the many programmes Feroiga offers, like Leadership, Nifty, Be Happy, Be Healthy. And if you would like to find out more, please visit www.feroiga.ie. With us tonight for our Trades and Apprenticeships webinar, we are joined by Shane Fagan, Christopher Gibson, Michael Costello and Terry Clark. This evening's webinar will be a mixture of speakers and interviews. Each panelist will share their professional story and after each person has spoken, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. You will notice along the bottom of your screen, there is an opportunity to open the Q&A feature. We strongly encourage all attendees to use this feature and to get involved. At the end of the webinar, and after all speakers are finished, we will be running an, an evaluation poll. It will only take a minute and we would really appreciate everyone taking the time to complete it. So first up tonight, we have Shane Fagan. Shane studied Mechanotronic Engineering in AIT and then completed a fitter apprenticeship course with Solus. Shane now works as a fitter with Ford Nimona. Shane, you're very welcome tonight. And I'd like Bernie to do the interview with you. Thanks very much for having me. Hi, Shane, how are you? Welcome along um, to the panel. So um, Shane, just a few questions, I suppose. The first one we'll start off with is, um, you might just tell us about yourself, where you're from and what you do. Um, just a brief introduction of what you do. We'll get into the nitty gritty later on, but maybe just as a starting point. Yeah, uh, my name is Shane Fagan. I'm from Drumraney. There's a place between Adlone and Mullingar. I am a favourite with Born Lamona since 2011. And yeah, I won't go into any more details now with that. Okay, so you're a fisher with Born Lamona. So um, Shane, we might go back to um, secondary school, if you can remember that far back. Um, I don't think it's that long ago, though. Uh, did you do more technical subjects in school or, or, or was it something you were always aiming towards? You know, did, did you always see yourself as doing something that involved like working with your hands or in, in that area? Yeah, I went to secondary school in Moat, so I suppose construction and engineering were two of my favourite subjects and we were very lucky in Moat because in engineering especially we were, we were allowed to use lathes, milling machines, stuff like that. Maybe some other schools wouldn't have that use probably of them machines and that kind of gave me a taste of making stuff and you know I wasn't really a fan of the books when I started doing stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, it probably gave me an idea back then that it was going to probably be where I'm... It was going to basically end up where I'm going to end up working. You know, it gave yeah. me a good taste for it. Mm -hmm. So when you left school then, you went on to AIT and you studied... You might pronounce it first properly. Mechatronic engineering. Mechatronic engineering. Okay. So that is, I, I know we actually had somebody who talked about it when we were doing our engineering. So you might just explain that is a combination of. It's mechanical and electronic engineering. It's basically the hardest modules out of mechanical engineering and the hardest modules out of electronic engineering combined into one course. It was fairly full on. I was 37, I think 38 hours a week. Okay. So it was tough now I have to okay. say okay so you did two years in AIT and yeah. then you were like yeah and what happened next this fantastic opportunity came along yeah I had actually a couple of friends who were contemplating going to Australia it's around the time Australia was taken off there was you were always hearing these good stories and I mm -hmm. was kind of second guessing what to do and it was actually somebody at home said to me that Bordemona was advertising for apprentices and at the time I didn't even know what a construction plan fitter was to be honest I never even heard of one so mm -hmm. I looked up the job I applied for it I done I think it was that one aptitude test two interviews and a medical and 
out of I think was it between eleven and twelve hundred people, there was eleven positions. I was lucky enough to get one. Okay, so you were really lucky. So if that was the the, the case it, with the numbers. Um, so you started off then your apprenticeship in Borden Mona. So obviously you said there at the start you live in the Midlands. So were yeah. you based in the Midlands or where did you? Yeah, when we applied for the job, from? when we applied for the job, we we didn't really know where we were going to be based. I knew that they had bases basically all around me. Uh, I was no more than an hour's drive from any of them. So uh, when I actually got offered the job, I then realised where I was going to be was Shannon Bridge. So that started in January 2011 and I served my entire apprenticeship there. Okay. So was it all based there or did you go to any college or any training centre or anything during your time? Oh yeah, uh, I started in Shannon Bridge, that was phase one. Uh, phase two then uh, it was Baldoyle Industrial Estate in Dublin. That was mm -hmm. for five months. Uh, then phase four was in Cork and phase six was in Cork. And the phases in between college were back at Shannon Bridge at Port Mona worked. Right, so it was a mix. You were in, yeah. you know, you were in both, right. And, um, but I'm assuming from the get-go, Shane, you were working, like as in, you were probably shadowing somebody or how did it work? Yeah, from day one, like I suppose from Port Mona's point of view, you're a new employee, they don't know what you're capable of. So for mm -hmm. probably safety reasons, they're not going to just let you off around the workshop to just what? dig in straight away. So you were put with a senior fitter, probably a lad that knows his stuff, you know, it's the best person to learn from basically. And as time goes on, they'll kind of, they'll gauge you on what you're capable of doing and they'll kind of let you off on your own then. But uh, it was, it's normally, I think, roughly six months before you can go to phase two. But I was actually, I don't know, is there a backlog of people, but I was actually a full year uh, say a first year on site which was actually no harm you know it gave me that little bit more experience before I actually went to phase two so that helped me a lot. Okay right Shane so you might tell us what is a fisher or it's in the extended version sorry I know sorry I'm, I might be disingenuous to the same so what does a fisher do? Uh, a fisher is like a combination of a couple of things really it's a heavy plant mechanic basically is what it is you can work on anything from a consaw up to a hundred ton digger and above dumpers. Uh, in Borden Moan, I know we work on plant machinery as well as tractors, loading shovels, teleporters, uh, diesel generators, literally anything that you will see even in a tool hire shop. Judging by your trade, you should be able to fix it. Mm -hmm. So there is a wide variety of what you can do and what you should be working on. Uh, you know, I know lads who have served their time as a fitter and they work in tool hire companies. Uh, a lot of lads that were in college with me, there was a big group of us from Borden Mona, there was another big group from Tara Mines. Uh, they were the two main companies in the country, so there's a huge variety on what you could be working on. Welding, fabrication, Engines, transmissions, hydraulics, you name it. There's no real end to what you'll be doing. Okay. Um, so your day-to-day -day job now. So no, actually, I might just step take back there. You finished your apprenticeship with Board Namona. Yeah. And um, were you lucky enough to be kept on? Yeah, I came out of my apprenticeship and I was offered a one-year contract. And mm -hmm. that was kind of the going thing at the time. It was one year contracts or two year contracts and at the end of my one-year contract, I was kind of in limbo again, and I was offered uh, an indefinite contract, which is as good as permanent nowadays. So that was in 2016, and I've been there ever since. Okay, uh, just a reminder, if anybody has any questions, you can hop them into the Q&A box. Um, the the Q&A box should be on the bottom of your screen. So Shane, your day-to-day -day job, what, are you just, Maintaining and fixing machinery? Yeah, basically, uh, say for tomorrow morning, I'd have a fair idea what I'm going to go at, but that's not to say I'll win in the morning and I'm going to get to do the jobs that I want to do. Uh, 
my foreman or supervisor could come to me and say there's a machine broken down, will you go to it? You could be asked to do something completely different that you planned for the night before. You could mm -hmm. go to a breakdown and you could think it'll take you an hour, it could take you the full day. You could think it'll take you the full day, it could take you two hours. You know, there's a huge variety in the work. There's no such thing as two days the same. And that's one thing that I kind of enjoy about it. It's, it's not repetitive. It's not the same thing day in, day out. Mm -hmm. And are you mostly working inside or outside? Uh, it's it's mixed really. Uh, I suppose more than one and years from past was kind of focused on peat harvesting. So a lot of it during the summer would have been outside and the majority of it during the winter, not at all, unfortunately, is inside. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of, it's in and out. So that's good as well because you're not stuck in a workshop all day, every day. You do get out on the road and get out and about and the day goes that little bit quicker. Okay. Um, we had a few questions, Shane, that were submitted beforehand. Um, was there any specific um, subjects that you did in school that you feel might have helped you? Say if somebody is on here tonight and they're in TY and they're thinking about subject choice, was there any subjects that you did that you may have found useful when you went on to uh, do your um, apprenticeship? Yeah, definitely. The big one would be engineering. Uh, Engineering and construction, I suppose, kind of gave me a taste of what it was to make stuff with my hands and stuff like that. And engineering more so, I kind of found myself interested in how stuff works and trying to tweak them a small bit and make stuff better and materials and, you know, mm -hmm. like I said, using lathes, milling machines and just getting a random piece of metal and turning it into something, you know. I always was interested in that and how stuff mm -hmm. works, so... Yeah, engineering is, is definitely a big one. Okay. Um, we have a few questions now coming in as well. Uh, one here from Jar says, I'd like to know how much maths was involved in doing your apprenticeship. And um, I'll ask you that one first because there's two questions in Jar's um, question. Was there much maths involved? Uh, I thought myself initially there would have been more. Uh, it's, it's quite manageable now, to be honest. It's not that bad. Uh, okay. you know I as I said before I wasn't one for the books so I was kind of dreading that after college I said I don't want any more you mm -hmm. know more theory than anything so listen it's it was something I was interested in I was doing maths I was doing calculations basically on engines like working out compression ratios and stuff like that you know it's easy when you're interested in it so yeah I yeah. Some of them are not, they're not going to go over your head, you know, you're, you can relate all the numbers to something, which is a big help. So I'd say it's, it's not too bad. Okay. And the second part of Jerry's question, Shane, is what was the most challenging aspect of your apprenticeship? Which is a great question, actually. Ooh, uh, I suppose the exams really was, I wouldn't say challenging, but it was kind of a bit of pressure, like, you know, at the end of each phase, at the end of phase two in Dublin, we had practical exams and written exams. At the end of phase four, it was the same. And at the end of phase six, and to forget, progress to the next phase, you had to pass your exams. So that was challenging in itself, you know. And when you went back to work then, after passing your exams, you were let do but that little bit more in work. So you were constantly progressing. So that was probably the toughest. And I suppose the last batch of exams were tough as well. You know, you had that little bit of pressure hanging over you that if, you know, this is the final hurdle, you didn't want to fail. So yeah. that was probably it. Okay. And Ethan then has a question, Shane. Are your days a standard nine to five or do they vary? Mm. Or what are your working hours, I suppose? I suppose standard working hours would be eight, half, four. Uh, the last couple of months now we are getting busy. Uh, for the moment, it's kind of going away from pea harvesting. We're going into bog rehabilitation. So... Since last September, we've been starting at seven in the morning and up until Christmas, we were going to about half six in the evening. There was a big push and get the machinery out. And in previous years gone by, even when I was an apprentice, uh, there was a big season outside to it. So during the summer, if you were busy, you could be starting at seven in the morning and you could be still there 12 hours later. So, you know, there isn't really a standard day. I'd like to think there is, but... You know, it's like any job, you, you 
it's the day you normally want to go home at half four is when you get a phone call at four o'clock and say, can you do this? And then yeah. you get held on to for a couple of hours. But normally, normally I'd like to think it's eight to half four. Okay. And Monday to Friday, or would you work some weekends? Uh, some weekends, yeah, there is weekend work involved. Uh, we cover all the peat, say, all the transport of peat going into the power station in Eden Dairy. So it's not that you can just flick off a switch at the weekend or else you'd have no way of making tea and turn on the lights. So, yeah, it's six days a week. A lot of lads do shift work, so it's seven days a week. There's a lot of nights as well involved. Lucky, the maintenance side of it, we're kind of staying away from the night shift, but okay. it's something it'll be, it'll be waiting for you the following morning when you go in. So I have another question in here, Shane, from Ailish. Uh, she wants to know, could you have gotten your apprenticeship without having attended college? Like, were there people in your in your apprentice class that didn't go to any third level? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There was lads in my course that didn't go to college, came straight out of mm -hmm. school, maybe had a relation that had a garage, was, you know, working during the summer at machinery or had some bit of experience, like, and I think that was a big help as well. You know, they want to either see you having some bit of a background with machines or okay. I was basic. just about to ask you that yeah I was just about to ask you that Shane because throughout all the um, seminars we've had so far you know questions have come up around work experience and um, would you and now I know at the minute with COVID it's quite difficult for young people to get work experience but would you recommend that if somebody was interested in a specific apprenticeship that they might try and get a a feel for it or get experience say in your case with machinery if they were interested in plumbing that way or an electrician or just to see what the role is like yeah definitely yeah it's a big help it'll give you it's the best way to find out whether the career is going to suit you or not whether you want to have an interest in it you know it can look like one thing from the outside but then when you actually get in and get a taste for it it could be completely different and you could discover then it's not something you'd like or not just something you want to do Mm -hmm. okay well Shane I think that's it for now um, we will come back at the end as we said and do our large Q&A and we'll involve you in that as well but for now I'm just going to hand back over uh, to Jim thanks a million Shane perfect thank you okay, thank you very much uh, next up tonight to speak we have Christopher Gibson Christopher is currently working in his first year as an engineering apprentice working for CompuLift in Monaghan and before anyone needs to ask, that is actually combi lift right behind him in the screen there. That's not, that's not, a, that's not a television show. How are you? Listen, I'm going to hand you over to Erica Reid. Um, hi, Christopher. Thanks very much for um, being with us this evening. Yeah, no problem. So, Christopher, can you just give the young people listening um, just a little bit about your background and, um, you know, if or... You're doing, a, you're doing a, currently doing an apprenticeship now with CombiLift, isn't that right? Yes, so my background would be fairly similar to Jane's. I would have done some college and then I did the traineeship. I passed that, worked for two years, and then I applied for the apprenticeship. So we'll take you back just step by step, just for the young people who are considering it. So when you were in secondary school, did you... Were you? Did you have a clear idea of what direction you wanted to take when you left school? Probably for seniors. Oh, sorry, for junior cycle, not really. Mm -hmm. I just knew I wanted to do engines, like all kind of the technical subjects. Okay. So I did what did I do? I did like engineering and science and that sort of stuff. And then okay. I kept that stuff when I went to senior cycle. I did engineering and chemistry. Okay. Normally, a lot of people would pick physics, but that's it was either, in my school. It was either physics or the engineering. So. Okay. I knew what I wanted to keep. Like. And um, then you did your leaving cert and what did you do next, um, Christopher? I did my leaving cert and then I went to Rathlone. I, similar to Shane, I did uh, an engineering degree, a uh, Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering and Renewable Energies. A level of seven, stayed there for a couple of years. Uh, I enjoyed it, but it is quite, it is very book heavy, which would be my sort of forte. Is, uh, and how long did it take you to um, get that qualification or how long were you in the AIT? Well, unfortunately, I never finished it, unfortunately. Finished which it. Is probably yeah. one regret I have, but it's the only thing is some of that stuff that I learned there has stood towards me during my apprenticeship, so it's made that part a little bit easier. 
So there's a lot of young people on the various um, webinars, Christopher, and you know they are trying to make decisions about subjects, and they think if they make the wrong choice, and you know that it's that's that decision is wrong for the rest of maybe their adult life. But like we always try to say in these webinars, that lots of people go to college and end up doing something completely different, or don't finish one course and might go do another course. So like that's a good example of you know that you went and decided it wasn't for you. And then I um, moved on to do something else. So, actually, like, there's a lot of boys I met in college who had never done engineering in school. They never lifted a tool outside of it or nothing, but they just decided that's what they wanted to do. Okay. And so when you left AIT, what did you do next then? I worked for, I just took up my old job and I worked there. And then I applied for the traineeship in Combilift, which is a one year engineering course it's kind of like a very basic crash course in engineering and um what was the application process like that to join um combilift so there was like an open evening so you'd go and you'd fill in an application form and then they'd go back to you you'd do an aptitude test and an interview and then you'd get your letter on whether you were accepted or not so what is the apprenticeship like now like what's your daily routine with combilift at the moment so for the apprenticeship, like you go in, it's half eight to half four, and you do different subjects. So you have your maths, and you just go in, you do your subjects, and then go home. And do you get to do much practical uh, work experience in the college or the apprenticeship? Yeah, there is a lot of hands-on stuff. So we're doing a lot of uh, electrics, electronics, uh, OEM practices, which is kind of like your metalwork, engineering, your hands-on. So using your lathes, metal machine, drills, that sort of stuff. There's communication, applied engineering, which is your maths as well. Um, there is a question here, Chris, for asking is if it's a paid uh, apprenticeship. Yeah, it is a paid apprenticeship, yeah. Yeah, okay. And um, what's the most challenging part of, of the apprenticeship for you? That's a good question. Uh, I, I don't really find any of it really that challenging because that's, something that I'm interested in and I can kind of handle it, I suppose. I can just kind of get Are, grips on it. Do you find any of the subjects particularly difficult or more challenging? Probably, like most people, probably the maths. I wouldn't be the biggest fan of the maths, but I, I try my best. And what's your favourite part of the apprenticeship? Definitely the, the hands-on stuff. That's okay. what I enjoy the most. And what is the... Um, Aspiration after this apprenticeship now for you, Christopher, is it to get a job with Combi Lift or is it to do what would be the next step for you? Yeah, I'd like to continue my career, I suppose, with Combi Lift. Like I enjoy working here. Like it's a nice place to work and there's plenty of opportunities for those that want to move up. And can you give um, the young people listening, you know, what it's like to be, I mean, Combi Lift is a global or or global company, it's a massive factory. So can you just Give the young people, we can see it behind you, just a flavour of what day-to-day -day life in Cabby Lift is in such a big um, company like that. Just, you know, maybe different roles and or different people you work with. Yeah, so it, it all depends. You could be put on the assembly line itself or you could be given a sub-assembly. So if on a sub-assembly you make up parts and then other people take them and then eat them. Not so if on the assembly line you have different stages or you're working with other people. Sort of as a team, if you want to say, mm -hmm. it makes things a bit easier. So if you don't understand something, they can help you out and vice versa. And like it's nice. And are there skills that you think are necessary to do this um, job? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know uh, we had um, Dylan on from CombiLift who was talking about the engineering and he said a big part of his job is communication because he had to liaise with so many different departments or different people. So he said communication was um, a skill that he would have thought was necessary. Are there any that you feel? Uh, yeah, I'd agree with what Dylan was saying. Definitely in the past couple of years, there's been a big push in communications. Even in the college, we do our own communication subject. There's a big thing about having, understand how to talk to people and listen and interpret other people. But um, yeah, I think that would be the biggest thing. Because definitely everyone knows the easier it is to get along with people, the better to be. Okay, and there's a question here asking, if you're contracted to work for Combi Lift for a certain length of time after your apprenticeship, like, is it an agreement that you have to stay for six months or a year? Or um, I wouldn't be 100% sure on that. I know I, for the traineeship, we did like a one-year kind of 
test or to see how you get on. But as far as I'm aware, there isn't really like if if you don't like it, it's you can move. I don't, think it's, a, I don't think it's a big deal. Like you can just go back to your work. Like. Um. And are the, are all the apprenticeships somebody's asking in CombiLift um, paid, or are there different types of apprenticeships available um, that people can sign up for? As far as I know, you, you have the traineeship, which is a one-year course. It's paid, and the apprenticeship is paid as well. I think that they, they did do a short welders apprenticeship or course there recently. I wouldn't be I wouldn't know one hundred percent about it, but definitely oh, the two are, are definitely paid. Anyway. And um, do you get to work with, are you mentored in the apprenticeship in the factory and are you shown uh, or, or mentored by um, maybe more senior people? Well, we have our own mentors who would help us switch our kind of, because we, we'll finish our apprenticeship now, so we're going back to work next week. So we still have different um, job cards and paperwork to, and projects to do. So they'll help us out with that if we have any issues and that sort of stuff. Um, would you have um, any advice for young people who are considering an apprenticeship just while you're going through it yourself? Would you recommend um, it? Would you? Oh yeah, I would, 100%. It, obviously it's down to the person. Like, yeah. I'm very hands-on, so it suits me because that's how I would learn. Yeah. And I was like, if people want to go to college, that's fine. It's, people used to make a big deal about apprenticeships that they're not worth a whole pile. But in the past couple of years, it's been a big push on apprenticeships and they definitely are worth it depending on what you're interested in I suppose. And is there, and maybe you don't know the answer to this Christopher and if you don't that's fine, but is there an opportunity to continue sort of learning with CombiLift? Like are there other courses that they you can do with them? You know, when you the, finish this? Um, I wouldn't, I don't know. At the minute this is what they have. I assume they're going to continue to push and make new programs so people can upskill. Yes, of course, yeah. Over the next couple of years. So it'd be nice to see that too. And is there anything about the apprenticeship or the process that you would um, maybe highlight for young people considering it that you wouldn't have known before you've done it? So anything you would say, well, listen, you're going to have to do this or you're going to have to, um, you know, do extra work or whatever it is. Uh, you, will, you will have to do work outside of college. You will have your different reports and your projects to do mm -hmm. but it's kind of pretty similar to kind of secondary school really. okay and just one um last question christopher so um a lot of the people um on these webinars always ask about sort of the work-life balance or the you know is your time consumed now really with like studying and trying to do whatever you're doing in combi lift and or is it um you know, do you get to much time off and get to enjoy the apprenticeship or enjoy studying? It is very balanced. Like, so you have your time to do your stuff in class, and it's not massively book heavy either. Like, okay. Like we've done all, we have all our exams done, and a whole pile of work to be done. Okay, thanks a million, Christopher. We have um, questions for you again at the end when we are doing the panel, but for the minute, thanks a million. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, third up tonight, we have Michael Costello, who is the commercial director with D-Light in Waterford. Michael has a long career working as an electrician. As part of his career journey, Michael spent over seven years living in London to help develop his lighting career. You're very welcome, Michael. Hi, thank you very much. And Eric is going to interview you. So, hi, Michael. Thanks again for joining us this evening. Um, so again, Michael, can you just give the young people listening in just a bit, a bit of background of um, what what you did and um, you know sort of your career path? Just a quick kind of summary of it. Yeah. So um, I um, when I was in school, I really didn't have an interest in going to college. I never really wanted to. So I had an opportunity and um, was given an opportunity to work for a local electrical company. So two weeks after my leaving cert, I started as an apprentice electrician in Dublin. Um, Served out my time, but at that time, um, it was like similar to how Shane was saying there. It was supposed to be six months on, then you on site, and then you did your off site work with FOSS, and then you went to college um, for the last few phases. But um, it was at the turn of the the, the, the last boom, the downturn. And um, I ended up having about a seven year apprenticeship 
looking for new employee employers to make sure I could get into college to finish out my time. Um, the only benefit of that was that I had a, I learned an awful lot and um, I kind of became quite skilled by the time I actually did qualify and I traveled quite a bit as well, which was probably nice. Um, I then made a conscious decision that I wanted to stop traveling. Um, so I wanted to get into an office. I hadn't picked a career path, but I just wanted new that I wanted to get somewhere fixed that I could go to work to every day and kind of fell into the lighting business through a local um, a local company here in Tremor. Um, I worked for that company for two years um, and then I moved to London um, for the same company for a couple of years and then I started with a lighting manufacturer in London for five years and now I'm back working for the company back in Tremor now again. So um, just can you explain for the young people, so what kind of jobs or would you have had, Michael, it, throughout that seven year apprenticeship? So can you give them a flavour of some of the places you might have worked or some of the people you might have worked with? Yeah, sure. So I said my first ever job, the first day I arrived on site was in um, the Beacon Hospital in Dublin and um, when mm -hmm. it was being built. And um, I then moved to another electrical company that was doing a lot of housing um, around the local area in, in Waterford. And um, from there, I went into commercial work around Waterford, so shop fitting and um, retail and um, stuff like that. And then from that point, I went to Wales uh, and I did a year in a power station and building a new power station in Pembroke in Wales, which was a very different site to the apprenticeship, which was much more industrial. I hadn't done much metal work up to that point. Um, so, and then when I moved back from Wales, I spent a year doing um, a lot of retail fit outs. So going in on night shifts into big supermarkets and changing over light fittings from old technology to new technology. And um, was there favorite parts of it that you had or were there, were there ones that you found particularly interesting? Yeah, well, I, I kind of, when, when I stopped um, doing electrical work really on site, I, I missed the physicality of being on site and working with my hands as much as I had done. Um, I'm lucky enough that I can still do some kind of small bits in the workshop and so on, some tinkering around with systems that we have, uh, that, 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 that we work with in the lighting industry, but um, I definitely missed the physicality of, of the, the job. So, Michael, you work now for Delight, so can you tell people, you know, sometimes can have a very preconceived notion of what an electrician is and what that profession is. So can you give the young people um, just a little um, piece of information about what your job is, your daily routine, and maybe some of the professional relationships that you have, or you have to, um, you know, work with people. Who yeah, well, I suppose that um, I now work as a commercial director, but I, I kind of sit between the design team we have for, for doing lighting planning, and, and so I do a little bit of design work myself, and probably the, the invoicing and kind of boring side of the company, the, the, the sales side. Um, but Every day, I, I still always use my apprenticeship because uh, we still have to work out voltages and lighting circuits and um, and fault finding for electrical systems and control systems and stuff like that. So I never really not out of being an electrician. And um, like yesterday, I was I was doing we, we do a three D render for um, a new development in Dublin. That's a park. It's going to be a new park development, proving light levels and calculations. So we build those in. 3D images and, and prove we have lighting files and we prove the light is going to be correct. And this morning I was talking to um, a contractor doing a, a development about um, whether the light he's using in the in the stairwells is correct. Um, so it does vary a huge amount. And did you, when you were talking about doing a, um, a kind of sort of like additional roles like the design and did you have to upskill for those or did you learn that through experience, Michael? Um, I learned a true experience. Uh, everything that I have kind of done has always been true experience. I, I, no, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of sitting down into a book. I'm, I'm much better and have always been better with on the hands and learning on the job and learning as you go along. And um, I find it much easier. And um, sometimes it can get you into trouble a little bit when you get out of your depth, but um, we all know how to swim. I think it's, it's not so bad. Um, there's a question here, Michael, asking, would do you recommend for young people to do any specific subjects um, if they were going to study electric, to be an electrician? Um, yeah, well, I suppose physics was one um, that I ended up going to do by mistake um, because I, I, I liked the, the other two lads. I wanted to do construction and I wanted to do engineering. 
Um, but the auction, the engineering class filled up and I didn't get into it. Um, so I ended up doing physics. Um, and that really stood to me when you get to the, the college side or the offsite learning part of being an electrician. And um, did you have any experience of, like, did you ever do work experience with an electrician when you were in school or? Um, no, how I kind of probably got to the electrician part was that I was volunteering in a local theatre and um, I ended up kind of helping out with the, the guys doing the lighting and the soundboards, which was somewhat electrical um, and just kind of felt that I, I had a, an interest in it, I suppose. Um, a lot of the mentors, Michael, on these webinars have recommended for the young people to go out and, you know, get work experience or volunteer with the local organisation and get involved in what they think they would like to study. Would you recommend uh, young people to do that before they decide on um, doing an apprenticeship? Yeah, I think 100%. Uh, I, I don't think that um, any one path is always, the, is always where you're going to end up. So there's so many options in, 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 in the guys that I see daily on, on sites, a lot of those electricians don't do a lot, don't do electrical work anymore. Mm -hmm. They're in so many different types of industries now. Um, like myself, I'm in lighting, there, there's, there's guys in um, manufacturing. Um, a, lot, a lot of how electrical is broken up now is, is um, you, you just don't do electrical degree anymore. You do factory work, you do PLCs and computer programming. And, and, and so they're all very different and you can specialize in all those areas. So. Definitely, I think if if you have a something in interest, you you should you should pursue it. I'm sorry for looking right, but I'm just reading the okay. questions on the other screen, Michael. Um, uh, somebody's asking here. Tiernan is asking, what was the studying part of it like? Was it difficult? Um, you do. So it is quite a. You have quite a lot of time to kind of get to grips with the, the studying part. Um, the the first you you do, you do six months in force, which is a day to day. You do six months, and it's. It's quite a slow, it's similar to um, a relaxed school environment, I suppose, where you, you learn practical as well as, um, as the, 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 the theory behind it all. And um, then you come back to site, you do a, a nine months to a year and you go back, you go to a college then. So I, did, I was in WIT in Waterford here um, and you do three months, um, which is, I'd say, 80 percent theory, um, which is the, 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 the workings out of cabling sizes and, 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 and stuff like that. And then you do another nine months and then you come back and do another three months in college. Um, there is a, a question here, sorry. Um, is it common for employers to cease the contract during apprenticeships? So I know you said um, it took you a while. Well, I probably, I, I was at the wrong time when, when mm -hmm. construction really, really stopped in, um, in, in Ireland and there really just wasn't any jobs for people to work in at the time. Um, but at the same coin, a lot of people only really wanted to hire apprentices um, because it was a it was a, ch a cheaper wage, I suppose, to, to get in. So as an apprentice, you have a better chance of keeping on and, and working on as a consistently. But I can see it from dealing with contractors daily and construction companies daily that they really just can't get enough of new guys into 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 the into the industry on apprenticeships. So, um, so there's. Someone asking exactly what you do when you talk about designing lighting and things like that. Can you just give them a little bit more information about um, maybe a job you've done as an example for them? Yeah, um, sure. So we, we, we use a software called um, Dialux. There's a couple of others, but that's the one that I, I particularly use. So we would get a, a drawing over of, um, of a project, be it external or an internal, like maybe your house for, the, for all the same. And we would build that in 3D imaging and 3D renders, put in all your rooms and then... Um, we would put the lighting in that we feel would be right for, for your type of job. So if it's maybe if it's a retail environment, we would put in track lighting in the windows and um, high quality lighting to light up all the, the stalls for there's maybe dresses or clothes or, or, or whatever. Um, and making sure that it's lit correctly. So in a retail environment, um, they're presenting their products the best so somebody could buy them. So you're, you would deal a lot then with, directly with clients and meeting the needs of those clients. So are there um, soft skills like communication when I spoke to about Christopher, are there skills like that that you think are very important for people or young people to have? Yeah, you... without a doubt. Um, a, a lot of my day is on the phone and speaking with clients or being on Teams meetings, um, whether it's, it's just presenting uh, some of the light, lighting that we're, we're putting towards people or whether, whether it's um, talking through a project or at the very, very early stages, 
um, getting a feel from an architect of what the architect would like for, for their project. Um, it's, it's, it's nearly all communication from email or phone or, or Teams or Zoom calls or whatever. And you've mentioned software there. Um, so it would it be important for you to have um, like very good or very strong IT skills? Yeah, I kind of probably feel uh, as uh, you see, as, uh, maybe in, in the electrical trade as well as that, there is modules for, com for using computers for programming PLCs and, and like stuff, which again is a, can be a separate trade. Um, even with alarms as well, you're, you have to program alarm fittings and stuff like that. So yeah, it is always important, especially if you ever get into some sort of environment uh, of an office or you're in and out of buildings. I see a lot of the, the engineers go around with, with pads now and that's how they record processes and thoughts and, and so. Um, you mentioned um, working in Wales. Is um, electrician a trade you can travel with? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's very widely. Generally, if you go to different countries, they will have slightly different rules and you do a short course to um, to enable you to be an electrician in, in, in that country. They reckon the qualification is recognised globally. You just need additions to bring you up to speed with their local regulations. And, and so, yeah. Um, what's your favorite part of your job, Michael? Um, I suppose for me, it's probably meeting clients and, and making sure that the, the job that we're working on is, is the best job for that person at the end of the day, always. Um, I, I like seeing the end project um, from the very start to the very, very end. And what, if you were hiring now someone to work, um, uh, you know, in, some like an apprentice or a new person into the industry what kind of qualities would you look for in that person that you were hiring as an electrician um someone who's willing to work hard and really importantly listen um i think when you get onto a site it can be very daunting and you can kind of maybe hide because just these these guys are bigger and they're working and it's a very fast-paced environment but and um, being able to be to think a little bit ahead and have an ethic to to work hard and make sure that when you finish your day's work you are you are tired and you haven't just turned up for the sake of turning up, I think. And um, just one last question, Michael. Um, what advice would you give to young people now considering um, this as a career choice? Um, I would think that uh, it really opens up um, so many avenues of, of, of working these days. I know so many of the guys that I serve my time with, um, I'm in a kind of commercial sales role. There's guys who are in factories um, maintaining machines and there's guys who are still on site and um, wiring new new houses and new um new commercial premises and stuff. So it, it's kind of if if you feel you have any interest, uh, it's definitely worth exploring. Okay, thanks a million, Michael. We'll come back to you again right. with the panel, but for now, thanks a million. Thanks very much, Michael. Our final speaker of the night is Terry Clark. Uh, Terry works as a senior training advisor with Longford West Mead Education Training Board. Terry is responsible for apprentices and apprenticeship companies in Longford. Previously, Terry worked in the private sector before joining the team at FOSS, known now as Solace. Terry, good afternoon or good evening. How are you? <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be involved in this. It's really important. Thank yeah, you. Well, Thank you very much for coming on board. Terry, you're going to be able to answer all the apprenticeship oh, questions. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> about how we get involved in each of the apprentices that the guys are after talking about here. And I'm sure you're familiar actually with Shane's apprenticeship that he, he went through um, mm -hmm. to get where he is. So Terry, I'm going to open the floor to you. Uh, tell us about yourself and then maybe share a presentation with us about yeah, um, what you're working on. That'd be great. I suppose a little bit about myself. When I was 18, I did my leap insert and I hadn't a clue what I wanted to do. I just had no idea at all. And I think back in those days, it was like, well, if you didn't know what to do, just do a secretarial course because that'll always come in handy. So I spent 10 years then in the private sector in retail and um, admin work. And then I saw an advertisement in the paper for FOSS, for a receptionist of all things. And um, I got in there 26 years ago. So I started on reception and I learned new skills. Um, I moved into different departments. I got promotions. I did a degree. I got my master's. Um, and now I look after um, apprenticeship for Longford. I look after the companies and the apprentices too. And I also look after community training. So we look after training for early school leavers and people with disabilities and stuff as well. So it's a really varied job, which is great. And I absolutely love it. And I didn't choose it. And I'm really lucky, you know, to have the job. But um, 
it's not the sort of thing it's very hard I think when you're young and when you're 17 18 and you don't know what you want to do it seems like it's too young of an age to be trying to decide what you should do for the rest of your life but uh, I'm happy <laughs> so Tara you're bringing it to today's job and you are the senior training advisor for Longford West Bay Training Board so what is that? Um, okay, well, first of all, um, I deal with companies and I deal with companies first and we assess the companies and we make sure that the people in the companies are qualified to train apprentices, that they have enough work for that apprentice and that they have the tools and equipment that they're needed. Then from then on, then they register an apprentice through us um, and we do the registration and then we watch them. We look after their educational phases through one to seven, which uh, Shane and Michael were talking about the different phases. So we organize those and um, we call the lads away. We organize repeat exams if they need it. Um, they can be called anywhere over the country, um, as I'm sure Michael and uh, Shane probably realized. Um, there are so many trades. At the moment, we have 60 different trades and they're working on 19 new trades at the moment. Yeah. So the traditional trades, the trades that we had back um, before 2016, they're the trades that Michael and Shane would have done. So they're the four years, seven phases, um, three phases in college and four with the employer. But now on top of that, we have the new apprenticeship as well. And they're all completely different. There's whole loads of new trades. So what I was going to do, if it's okay, is I was going to just link up with the website because there's a huge amount of information on apprenticeship.ie and it tells you all the different trades because I can't see any other way of me explaining it without people falling asleep. Whereas if I click on here, you'll have a chance to have a look. So let's see how good my technology is <laughs> okay can you see that yeah and they put, yes okay and lovely okay so this is what the the um this is what the website looks like when you go in and it, it's just a little bit awkward if you don't know your way around it so that's why we're just going to have a look here so to click on here become an apprentice and it tells you down below all the different apprenticeships that we have so here's the newest one here that's a level six, that's after 2016. So these are some of the new apprenticeships. We have brand new ones in biopharma. We have new ones in construction, uh, electrical. These are all individual apprenticeships underneath the electrical banner. Engineering, again, all of those trades. Finance are all of the new ones too. Um, Hairdressing is brand new. Our first batch only went off to college in January. So that's a brand new one for us. Um, hospitality and food. Again, there's four there, including the new butchers program, which I saw some pictures of recently uh, in the paper. There's a ICT for people who are um, better at technology than I am. <laughs> and there's a insurance, um, logistics. As you can see there, there's five there in that section. Um, motor. Uh, the construction plant fitter there, you see that um, Shane did, is underneath there. Yeah. Um, we have property services, recruitment and sales. So as you can see, there's a huge amount of apprenticeships there available, way, way more than you would even expect. So if you have a chance, uh, it will be good to go in there. So say we have a look here at the construction one. Um, if you just go into uh, plumbing, we'll click on plumbing and it tells us about the trade. It tells us it's a four year apprenticeship and they qualify with level six and it answers any questions that you might have, you know, uh, what skills will you learn, how long is the apprenticeship, right down as far as how much will you earn. It even tells you what you'll earn for the different rates. Um, and then we'll just go back because there's actually there's so much information here. We'll go back again. And there's a find apprenticeship jobs as well. Now, this is a national database, okay? So all of this information, as you can see, there's all the companies all over Ireland that are looking for apprentices at the moment. And it tells you the different apprentices that they're looking for. So that's available there. Again, it's a, this is apprenticeship.ie, uh, or you could go in as apprenticeships jobs and you'll find it either. So that's really good there. Uh, let's see if I can get out there. Uh, there's some very good uh, slides as well. Uh, let me see, career advisors. 
yeah, there's quite a bit of information there. And I think that's probably the best thing. Um, the minimum education, I'll get out of that now. Let me see, stop share, lovely. Okay, so the, the, the um, education requirement for uh, uh, a, we call them a pre-2016 apprenticeship, which is Mosher and Block Lane and Carpentry and Plumbing and all those ones that we're all familiar with. That's a min you have to have a minimum of five Ds on a junior cert and um, you have to be over 16. Now, certain trades are going to need a colour vision test and we give you the, the template for that and you bring it to an optician. Um, only certain trades, obviously at any trade that has any electrical work in it or any colours. So things like painting is going to have to have a colour vision test and then obviously electrical, construction plant fitting, fitters, um, anything at all that they will be using um, that they might be dealing with electricity. So um, if they don't uh, specify um, in the legislation whether they have to have any specific um, uh, subjects like maths or whatever, but obviously uh, employers are going to pick the people that have the skills um, that they need. So it's very easy for me to say you only need to be 16 and you only need five Ds, but you're going to be interviewed up against loads of people that have leave inserts uh, a year in college or two years in college or whatever. So don't be in a hurry to leave school thinking, oh, I'm just going to do an apprenticeship because, you know, you're, you're just cutting down your chances of getting an apprenticeship. Stay on, do the leaving cert, and then you'll be in a good chance um, to get the best jobs that are going. Um, anything just else, Jim? Just looking there, uh, Terry, one of the questions I'm sure, that you think I was going to say press on, press on, how much would you be getting? What's the usual you, as an apprentice? How much would you be getting a week? Well, it depends now. There's different, the, diff, the trades are paid, paid differently. Do you remember we had like construction, engineering, uh, what else had we got? Electrical. So they're paid according to those trades. So say a first year motor mechanic or, or anyone in the engineering trades, they're paid around 200 euros as a first year, but they go up by about 90 euros a week. And um, the electrical one is, is higher. Uh, and there's a new one called uh, mechanical engineering rate. And that's for plumbers and pipe fitters who are working in the construction industry. Yeah. So that, that rate, and that rate goes up to 600 and something euros. Have I got it here? Oh, I don't have it here. It's uh, about 650 euros on fourth year. I mean, that's that's quite a lot of money, you know, to over three years. As, as you progress, it'll obviously go up as well. Okay, yeah. so incremental increases as, as, you, as you learn more and you become more experienced. I yeah, suppose. and it's a good increase. Like it could be 90 euros, 100 euros over a year. And that's that's a fair amount. So, well, it's good to have your eyes open. When you do go in, don't be expecting a full wage when you go in because you are learning, you're an apprentice, you're learning the skill. So you're gaining that experience as you go along and then gain gain the incremental increase in your wages as you go along. Well, I think so, you have to, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, um, Terris, Terry, just from my own um, experience of friends and that, that left school actually early and they took up apprenticeships uh, because I... I was around the time where the, the Celtic Tiger, as everyone has heard about it, a lot of people left school to actually take up apprenticeships to go on the construction sites. Um, one of the main things that they found it very, very difficult was to get their tools and equipment that they needed themselves. Is there grants available, um, Terry, or anything like that? No, I'm afraid not. But um, usually what happens is people will collect tools over phase one and then we send them a list when they're being called for their first phase away, which is phase two. And then they just get a few bits and pieces extra. And then by the time you get to phase four, you know, so you're kind of collecting them as you go along. You do need a bit extra. The idea is to perhaps, you know, get some tools for Christmas. If you know, if you know it's coming up and people are saying, what would you like for Christmas? Well then start working on the tools that you're going to need, you know, and build up a good supply um, of, you know, of what you're going to need. So Terry, if somebody was interested in becoming an apprentice, um, you I see there that you you look after the apprentice companies. Yeah. Do they register with you and you find the apprentices for them? Is it or? No. What usually happens is the employer uh, is registered as an employ as an employer with us, and then they usually contact us when they have somebody when they've already found somebody. Now I was showing you the apprenticeship jobs uh, link there. So that's what happens when employers 
don't have anybody, they advertise nationally to try and find somebody. But in most cases, they have somebody already before they come to us. Uh, people are calling into them, they're bringing in their CVs, they're talking to managers, they're saying, I'm doing my leave insert, you know, I really want to do an apprenticeship. Um, you know, will you take me on? Or they're in there already working Saturdays and summer holidays. You know, so in some cases, that's how they get in because they already, you know, they're, they're they're known to these companies nearly from being in. You know, right here, um, if I know someone who owns a business, could they hire me as an apprentice? Um, it depends on the company. What's really important is that we know that there's somebody there with a national craft cert or an advanced craft cert. So basically, we need to know that there's a qualified person in there with paperwork, not somebody who's been working in there for 10 years and never did an apprenticeship and somebody who is already qualified with paperwork. Um, and that they are going to be responsible for you and that they will train you and supervise you and watch over you because you can get into a lot of trouble as well if somebody isn't supervising your work correctly. You know, you are only an apprentice. You're not qualified. You're not expected to do big jobs all by yourself. You're supposed to be supervised and you're being trained on the job. Okay, okay very good. And one of the questions in here from Jane, are all apprenticeships for four years? No, they're all different at the moment. The older ones, the ones before 2016, they're all four years long. So they're the traditional ones that we all would have known over the years. They're uh, four years long, seven different phases. But the new ones now, some of the new ones that we looked at there are all different. There's two year apprenticeships there. There's three year apprenticeships there. There's level seven, level eight. There's even a level nine apprenticeship there. So each one is obviously going to require different things. Um, you're not going to go straight from school into a level nine apprenticeship, but you might already so say that will be for someone who's maybe perhaps done a degree or somebody who has done, there's a, a mechanical engineering one there. So that will be for somebody who's already done an apprenticeship as an electrician, and then he can add on two extra years there to go up one level. So, you know, you can't jump straight up, but you have to start and work your way up. Mm. I'm going to ask a very basic question here. What do you yeah. mean when you say levels? Okay, so like um, your junior cert is like a level three and your leaving cert, depending on whether it's an honours or a past leaving cert, is around four, five, and then and, and it's more four really, it really depends on how many honours subjects you're doing. And then uh, an ordinary degree is level seven, an honours degree is level eight, and level nine is a master's, that's where it is on the framework of qualifications. So, um, QQI, there might be a, the young people tonight might see QQI written around. That's what the levels are. That's what the levels are. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, if there's people out there that, that have left school early, you know, there's still options for you there. We have excellent community training centers all over the country. They do pre apprenticeship courses. They will allow you, male or female, doesn't matter, to try little tiny bits of all the trades, a bit of metal work, a bit of carpentry work. A bit of welding. It really depends on the on the centres, but there's lots of opportunities out there. Now that's a really good way and a great starter to get into a trade if you've already done a pre apprenticeship course. But if you've done your leave insert and you have a good leave insert, then you'd probably be ready just to go straight in as an apprentice with a company. Okay, very good. Um, so I have a question here and a very good question actually. Yeah. Do many girls do apprenticeships? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, we do find, I mean, obviously we want more, more females in apprenticeship. The ESB are a great employer for um, female apprentices. You know, they really promote it. Um, there's a bursary, um, which is an extra, extra two and a half thousand euros that employers will get if they employ a female apprentice. So that's really good. Now, remember that there's a grant aid there at the moment that came in last year. So anybody who employs an apprentice already gets three thousand euros grant aid. But if they employ a female, they get an extra two and a half thousand on top of that. So if you're going to an employer and you're trying to say, you know, choose me, um, I really want to do this apprenticeship. That's a really good selling point because that's going to cover your wages for a long time. You know, the, the grant aid that they're going to give you. So that's a great, you know, great advantage, I suppose, that you have, you know. What kind of apprenticeships do um, women normally go for? I know they go into every one of them, but what, what's the what's the typical one they, they 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 can go in, and um, I've seen them in motor, I've seen them in metal fabrication, I've seen them in carpentry. 
uh, I've seen them in plumbing, but I kind of we tend to find that they're all they're perhaps girls that are or, or females that it's a family business, and you know they've kind of grown up around it, and they've probably been doing a little bit of work with their dad or whatever at weekends. So we kind of find that that's mostly. But there's loads of new ones there. There's ones there. In, we saw them there. Um, insurance um uh, accounting um hairdressing i'm not saying hairdressing is for just for women obviously all of these trades are open to both to both male and female and we really do i mean there is a really a drive at the moment to try and get um more female apprentices in but i suppose it really depends on what you do if you're in school and, and you get a chance to do metal work or carpentry or mechanical drawing you're probably more likely to want to do an apprenticeship in the, the more traditional um, trades. Absolutely. And we heard there uh, from, I think it was Michael about physics as well. Like he he yeah. fell into physics, so, but it actually turned out to be a really good choice for him. Uh, in, in the electric, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> which is great, absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah, what do you mean by level nine? So level nine is the equivalent of a master's degree um, route. So that so they can go up to, up to level nine as an apprentice. Terry. Yes, yes, you can. Not in all trades, in just because I think there's one there in particular. So, but I mean, you can have a look yourself at the website apprenticeship.ie and have a look at all the trades, and it'll tell you all the different levels. And then, if you scroll down, you're able to find out, you know, what the what the um, education requirements are for some of those. So, some of those are are almost similar to applying to CAO for college places because they could be looking for um, the equivalent of like two honors or or higher level maths or whatever. Especially the ones in say um, the computer design stuff that side of things obviously they're looking for higher maths so it really depends but um we do find sometimes you know people choose things like metal fabrication and there's a huge amount of um uh, technical drawing involved and sometimes people come in to us and they don't have any technical drawing at all they've never done it they haven't done it for the junior search or the leaving search and that's really really hard to bring somebody up from nothing you know to um to first year apprentice um level so there's a huge amount of drawings in in in, certain, in some of the trades you know but look that's what they're there to learn <laughs> yeah, uh, terry i know that <clears throat> with the college aspect of the apprenticeship they have to they might have been sent off somewhere i know friends of mine went down to kerry down to tralee down to um, mechanical uh, engineering as an apprentice can you help them with accommodation sourcing accommodation usually um, what happens is the college will have a list and they're able because they have a student union so they normally have a list that they will give out we give um 70 euros extra accommodation on top of the allowance so basically what happens the apprenticeships before 2016 is that their employers pay them when they're with them and then we pay them when they're with us so the employer doesn't have to pay when when they're away to college because they're not getting any work out of them they're away learning so that's the older traditional trades so we pay an extra 70 euros for accommodation allowance on top of that. You know, it doesn't cover the full allowance. Um, you'd probably pay more than that. Uh, and then some people choose to travel. There's an allowance there of only about 30 euros max a week, I think, for travel. So you wouldn't want to be um, going too far, no. you know. Um, the, the other trades, the newer trades, your employer pays you the whole time. So whether you're with them or whether you're in college, the employer pays you. So some of those will be a block release. Some of those could be a day release, a day a week or two days a week. They're all different depending on the level and depending on the, the actual trade that you choose. Uh, Terry, thank you very much. We're going to open up the floor. To it, but before you go, can you just remind everyone there tonight of where to log on just to see all the different apprenticeships? Yeah, just go into apprenticeship, that's www.apprenticeship.ie and you can go on to apprenticeship jobs, you'll see all the jobs there. There's just one thing that's really, really important. Please make sure that you are registered. If you're with the company and they tell you that you're their apprentice, please make sure you're registered, that you fill out the paperwork and that we have it. If you haven't heard from us, we haven't got the paperwork and these things cannot be backdated. And I've often heard of people who are six months or nine months with a company um, and didn't know that they weren't registered. So it's a really important thing, you know, just pick up the phone and contact any of us in the training centres around the country. The ones that used to be the FOSS were now just all called training centres, but we're all belong to um, ETBs. Um, so pick up the phone, ring us and we can check for you. You know, it's really important. 
Thank you. Sorry for taking up no, so much time. No, no, <laughs> no, absolutely. And that's what we want to hear. Terry, just before you go, just as a, I know back in the Celtic Tiger area, a lot of people were, were, were leaving school or, or after school went to do an apprenticeship. And then there was a drop off in apprenticeships. Is, is there an in increase in interest in apprenticeships at the moment? Well, there actually is now, and it's probably because the grant aid is being offered. Uh, I mean, it's kind of, it's difficult to see that there was grant aid being offered while we were closed in, in certain respects. I mean, some of the construction trades were, were really closed. So there was no sites opened. But I mean, it's all opening back up again. And, um, you know, those grant aids are there now. And it is encouraging people to take on apprentices again. The electrical wall is particularly high, which means that there at some stage is going to be quite a long back, a backlog waiting to get called for phase two. That's your first time away in college. So just be aware of that if you're registering in any of those trades. The COVID has delayed us all a lot. So it might be like Michael. No, not Michael. You won't get seven year apprenticeship like Michael. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Terry. Okay, so I'm going to open it up to the floor here. So, if anyone has any questions that, that they would like answered, do still um, uh, pop them into the, the chat there. But I'm going to ask you a question, folks. Um, what advice would you give somebody that wants to uh, go down the apprenticeship route? Shane, I'm going to start with you because I think you have a few fans in the audience tonight there. I can, I can see that, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know, like I said before, uh, you know, if you can at all, try and do some work experience. Try and, you know, if you're thinking of going down a career path, try and get in, get a taste of it, see if you like it or not, because I know looking at it, it can be daunting thinking that you're after signing up for a four-year apprenticeship and then six months in, you realise this isn't for me, how do I get out of it? So, yeah, I would say try and sample it as much as you can, but if you have a fair idea... Like there is, in fairness, good variety in all the apprenticeships it's on now. So just try and see what you're interested in and try and stick with that. Absolutely. Thanks, Shane. So, um, Michael, what would you recommend? What would you say to somebody that wants to land an apprenticeship group? Um, go for it. Don't be afraid of, of trying an apprenticeship. Um, each apprenticeship, certainly in the electrical, like I did, there's loads of avenues. Once you get into it, you can specialise in different things. Um, so don't be afraid of it and go for it, really. Brilliant, brilliant. And Christopher, your first year this year, are you happy? Are you delighted you chose this path? Yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. Like, as the boys were saying, like, it's always good to kind of upskill and try new things because who knows where you'd get at the end of it. Like. I always admire uh, people that actually went on and to do apprenticeships. I am useless with my hands, you know, and that's why we are sitting behind a computer at the moment. Uh, but like a lot of my friends, they went down the carpentry, the construction, electrical. My own brother, my younger brother is an electrician. Um, and they, they, they never complain about work. They're always happy. Um, and I, I just, they always have a full wallet as well. So are you, <laughs> would you recommend it as a good paying, paying career to go down the, that route? Mm, uh, yeah, I suppose. I don't know about the full wallet bit anyway. Um, <laughs> I can't find it half the time, but... Yeah, as Michael was saying earlier on, listen, if you have a trade, you're never going to be out of work. It's something, as he said, that no matter where you go in the world, it's recognised. You might, as he said, do an exam just to get into a country. Say it's like if you wanted to go over to Australia and you need to change your driver's licence, it could be a simple exam just to get you in and get you going. But yeah, no, I, I definitely think if you have a trade behind you, there's no fear of you ever being out of work. Excellent. Terry, what, what would you recommend? To, I know you were you were saying to definitely make sure that they get the applying early. But what, what would you recommend for them? Um, it's a great opportunity. I mean, you know, it's it's if you go to college, you don't get paid, and you have to pay for the course. You have to pay your registration fee. Um, you might have to pay for accommodation because it isn't in your local area. Whereas apprenticeship is 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 a great opportunity. Um, God. What do I say? Um, have a look at what's there. You know, there's such a huge array. Um, another thing about apprenticeships, which is really great, is that if you start an apprenticeship and after, say, a year, you say, do you know what, I'd love to go off to Australia for a year. I'd love to do something. You can do that. And you don't lose your time. You don't lose the exams that you've already passed. And they're still there waiting for you when you come back. So there's that bit more freedom with an apprenticeship. I don't think you can do that if you go to college. I don't think you can do two years and then head off to see a bit of the world and then come back uh, quite as easy. 
but uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. You know, I, I think it's a no-brainer, really. And tell you, it doesn't affect your grant aid or anything like that if you do break the, break the time. No, the grant aid is for the employer anyway. So the grant aid is for him. He gets 2,000 euros up front when he registers an apprentice and then nine months in, he gets the other 1,000. So all that money goes to the, to the employer, not the apprentice, but then he's paying your wages. So at least he's probably putting it to your wages. Okay, Terry, there's a question in here for you. Could you provide a list of companies that have registered apprentices in the past, e.g. E ICT apprenticeships? Well, it's a terrible thing called data protection and that stops us from giving out details like that. So what you need to do is you need to root around Google yourself and find companies and call into them and ask them and talk to them. That's the only really way. And um, look up for advertisements. Um, it really depends on what trade you're interested in, but we're not allowed to give out company details like that. Um, and a lot of companies probably wouldn't really like it anyway. So the best thing is to have a look around Google. If you're looking for electrical contractors, Google electrical contractors in your local area. Or if you're looking to be a motor mechanic, there's loads of, mo of um, motor um, garages around your area. Call into them, bring in a CV. Don't just dump it on a table somewhere. Ask, can you talk to the maintenance manager or you know somebody that's actually going to take it and we're going to keep it and it's not just going to get thrown in a drawer. Um, that's the best. It's, I'm afraid it's a matter of kind of rooting and looking yourself, you know. Okay. And another one for you, uh, Terry, from Jane. If I start an apprenticeship and don't like it, can I change over to a new one? You can change over to a new trade, but you can't bring that time with you. So you can, you can, yeah. And even I, I have a number of people who actually have done two trades so I have a, a guy who um would did a motor mechanic trade and then afterwards he decided he wanted to be a fitter and he did that too so that's available to you you know this you can do any you just can't do the one trade twice <laughs> so if you start an electrical trade and you don't get through you can't start it again and try again you can only do it once okay but you can do well, as many trades as you want <laughs> well, question again it doesn't affect any grants or anything like that if you do change it no no. Okay. no. Folks, listen, thank you so much. That's the end of tonight. Uh, I just, on behalf of Feroiga, I'd like to thank you so much for participating tonight. And the final job of the night for everyone that's here attending is a poll, which has been launched right now. Just three short questions, so please complete it. On behalf of Feroiga, I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. We hope it was beneficial and that you all gained some insight. For those of you who would like to be involved in Freuga or that would like to learn more about our programs and how they can benefit you, we will send you an email with all the information tomorrow. I want to sincerely thank our panellists who have so generously given their time and shared such valuable advice. Without your credible panellists, none of these career web webinars could be, would be possible. Freuga is hosting more next week and throughout uh, May. And if you are welcome to attend others, if you wish. You can still register through Eventbrite. And don't forget, if you want to find out more about Freuge, go to www.freuge.ie. These webinars are actually recorded and they will be available as well on our YouTube channel. Thanks again, everyone, and good night. Thanks.